Old Man Sarge back again. Wait, welcome to my tabletop rant. I normally don't have a rant of any kind on my channel. I normally don't really get too uh, riled up about things. I love games, as you can tell, because my channel is kind of devoted, this channel anyway, is devoted to games. Um, I've always played board games ever since I was uh, pretty young, so I'm, I'm going to call this the Gragnar rant because I'm an older guy, so you don't have to listen to this or agree or disagree. It's up to you. I realize that I'm out of out of time, out of step with a lot of the uh, gaming communities right now, but I just want to talk about kind of the things I've been through with uh, miniature games in particular, and. Um, kind of how I feel about uh, the current state of affairs and what's going on in the community and what's happening and uh, my my opinions on the lore which is really a big draw for me into a game is uh, how good the lore is because I don't know why but it it always seemed like if the lore was good then I was more I guess interested in I guess immersing myself into that particular game or whatever. Um, so everyone's different. Some people like the mechanics of the games, uh, but for me it's always been the lore. <clears throat> the first tabletop game I really got involved in was Warhammer Fantasy. And you can see that I still have a collection of Warhammer Fantasy. I thought it was the, mechanically, I thought it was probably the best. Now I know that people have uh, they, people loved 40k at the time. In fact, it was more popular than fantasy. And I did play it a little bit only because some of my friends played it. There's, I think, the latest codex of 40k. Um, but I was more um, more interested in the fantasy aspect of things. I liked the uh, ancient battles where you would line up troops and then the blocks of troops would move up. It's kind of like in history, it would be anywhere from the Bronze Age on up to the uh, the Dark Ages. It's kind of where you would probably put the fantasy games uh, into. Um, my collection of, uh, of books, I did not have all these armies, but I did collect quite a few of them, and I played quite a few of them. But this was 8th edition. So this is pre-Age of Sigmar, for anybody who knows about Games Workshop's games. And it was superb, in my opinion. I think the reason that Games, Shop, games Workshop moved away was because grognars uh, were becoming a fewer portion of the population, and they're dying off, and um, they probably weren't buying as many models as the younger generation. And here's the thing. I don't fault Games Workshop at all for this, but here's their their latest uh, version of the game, Age of Sigmar, um, and I got to say that the models are absolutely fantastic. They did an incredible job with uh, with the models, but Age of Sigmar does not do what Eighth Edition did for me as a grognar, as an old time gamer, as a uh, block type gamer. Um, Age of Sigmar is the reason that I think that they moved to that was they were thinking about how do we keep the young, uh, younger generation involved in the community because of computerization their attention spans are much smaller and I'm not trying to insult anybody who's younger I'm just saying that they want things done quicker faster they don't want the the long aspects of a prepared battle where you would march things across the table you would try to get them to uh, into, into maneuvering into position and then you launch your attacks on your opponents and then you hopefully wipe your opponents out or drive them from the field of battle and that's really the idea behind um, behind the old 8th edition was it's more of a game of maneuver and I'm not saying that there isn't some maneuver in Age of Sigmar but there's some battles that I've observed with Age of Sigmar where you could just simply line up troops and roll dice and you wouldn't have to even worry about moving anybody. I mean, some people are going to probably disagree with me. That's fine. These are my opinions. Everybody is entitled to their own opinions. 
but I just did not find Age of Sigmar interesting. <clears throat> I didn't find the battles interesting on the tabletop. They, they've been trying to bring them into even smaller, or I think 40K at least. Let's do it on a 4x4 table. Now, if you think from a marketing standpoint, this is probably the right move. Because, again, people don't have a lot of space. They don't have, uh, most people in the world don't have a 6x4 table. Or in my case, I can actually put two 6x4 tables next to each other and, and play a game with a couple friends or whatever. I love team battles. And you really can't do that with most people in most places in the world. Most people live in the big cities and their spaces are much smaller and so a 4x4 table makes more sense. But the problem that I have is that you're not, first of all, you're not really in in encouraging the community to uh, gather in places. That's one complaint I have about that. I mean, yeah, you can play it at home, but you're not, the community isn't playing because they can just buy whatever they need, go home, play with their one friend, and because there isn't a lot of people they may know or invite over to their house or apartment or flat or whatever, um, they're not really, it's not really <clears throat> developing a community. It's just like an individual game. You might as well play uh, Warhammer Total War, which I, I play and I actually really enjoy. And the nice thing about Warhammer Total on War or Total War is it takes care of a lot of the mechanics that you would have to take care of to some degree on the tabletop. But there's just something about actually touching, feeling, seeing your opponent across the table, moving things across the table, that to me, I miss a lot of that. Now I have heard that um, in some form, Games Workshop within the next two or three years is going to bring back some form of 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy. I don't, I don't know what that's going to be, but um, I've heard some people, I hope it's 15 millimeters, some of my friends have stated that, and that would be great. That would be great because, first of all, I, I dislike painting models, and so the models are so good, I don't think they'll do this, by the way, because Games Workshop does such a great job in their model design, they're probably the top um, company in the world. Hand, hand, you know, there's a few companies that I would say are getting close or even equal, but Games Workshop, the older models were definitely, definitely much different than the newer models that you see today. They hide the mold lines. The old days, you'd really have to take your file out and go over the shoulders and where where the plastic connected to get rid of the mold lines. And the new and the new armies, um, the new models. They've actually hidden much of these mold lines, like very, very intelligently within, you know, underneath everything. So it's like if you love to paint models, I do not, but if you love to paint models, Games Workshop uh, has done an incredible job with their model design. <clears throat> now, going back to Age of Sigmar, I've had a few interesting games, but. I just don't, I just do not really care for the game that much. But I'm going to go over and show you what I have gathered from Age of Sigmar, some of the books that I have gathered from there. Uh, but here are my 8th edition books. I have a lot of these armies, or to some degree, like Wood Elves I have. Now when I designed the Wood Elf army for 8th edition, I was trying to, even though the rules set doesn't really allow you very easily to do it, mainly because the tabletop you're playing is a 6x4 you would have to play a 8x12 to really get this strategy to potentially work but in 8th edition there was this unit that the uh, I don't know if I can find it quick enough but there was this unit called Wild Riders I'll show you the models they're right Glade Riders right here Glade Riders and they basically have bows and they're mounted on horses and I was thinking, hey, I'm going to try to recreate the Mongolians with them. Because they're really the only ones that could do it. They had the speed, they have a fairly high leadership, and I was basically going to just pepper my opponents with arrows, and then when they charge me, retreat, rally, and then do it again. And just continue to do it uh, throughout the battle. It didn't work so good um, on a 6x4, which is almost always what we played with. 
but it was it was a fun thing to attempt to do. I have some dwarves. I didn't really care for the dwarves the way they played. Basically, the dwarves in Eighth Edition uh, were find a table quarter <laughs> like this, you know, like right here. Put your army there on a hill. Put all your cannons on a hill and just shoot your opponent to death. There really wasn't any maneuver with them. They were probably, in my opinion, one of the most boring armies to play. But some people that I played against, they absolutely adored that strategy. Just trying to whittle your your army down to nothing before you got to before you could get to them. Orcs and goblins were the most one of the most fun armies, and I have a huge orc and goblin army because uh, orcs and goblins basically their leadership's really low they're all about the numbers it's a swarm army um, and they're unpredictable they could you could basically I had units that would not move for the entire game but what's what makes that fun is you really don't because it's unpredictable if you're not really that concerned about winning the game you can either win or lose it doesn't matter you just have a good time it it's less strategic than these other armies in my opinion like these armies here you can play a lot more like I'm gonna win the game here works and goblins hey you may decimate your opponent because you get really lucky on some things but you also may just because of luck not do well dark elves the interesting thing about dark elves and high elves was I think they always struck first which means no matter who got into combat first who charged or whatever your dark elves were gonna be going first they, uh, I had a couple friends who played Dark Elves, and in fact, the um, two-on-two -two games that I've had, the most memorable games that I've had for two-on-two -two was uh, with a friend of mine, I'll just say his first name, Lane, we played Wood Elves, and then there was two other guys, one guy's name was Ray, the other guy's name was Chase, they played Dark Elves, and we did two-on-two -two battles, and I still remember those battles. They were the funnest battles I think I've ever had were Dark Elves versus Wood Elves and uh, two on two battles. They were, they were very fun. Um, High Elves, these guys are also very easy to, like they're, you think even you can find that in 40k, but their toughness levels are really low. So they're more of a finesse army, you know, let's hit them hard, get in as many kills as we can before they start hurting us because, you know, our, our toughness is so low. Um, I did enjoy, I have High Elves and I have, well I don't think I have, I didn't have Dark Elves but I actually have them for Age of Sigmar now or a part of them. Um, but High Elves, I did have an army of High Elves. Um, some of their our units had these immense ward saves which was really hard to get through. Um, I, they were interesting to play. Ogres, I had a big army of Ogres and they were fun to play. Some of the most memorable games I played were with a friend of mine who played Britonia, which I don't have that book, unfortunately, which is kind of sad. But um, he played a, an army of Britan Brit Britannia, which was Britonia, which was basically knights. And I played my ogres, and we, you know, he won half the games. I won half the games. His name was Cole. We did. A, we had a lot of fun playing uh, ogres versus uh, Brit Britonia. But again, it's the memories that you create that really make this uh, this game fun, I thought. Um, I mean, maybe you didn't have as many games as you could with Age of Sigmar in the shortest period of time, but you remembered them. I, you know, I remembered them a lot more than, than I've remembered most of my games with Age of Sigmar. But I'll talk about Age of Sigmar in a little bit. Vampire Counts, I have them. I really didn't play them much. I have a, a friend who loves them. Uh, his name is Derek. He absolutely adores them uh, when we played 8th edition, and he did a really good job with them. There was a couple people that don't play the game, or don't I don't see anymore. Jason was one of them, played uh, Warriors of Chaos. Uh, also, there was uh, another gentleman, younger gentleman, but uh, he, he played Warriors of Chaos. He's doing quite well in life right now. Um, Lizardmen, I never played, uh, his name, by the way, Hunter. Just if I want to throw names out, I guess. Um, Lizardmen were an army that I don't think I really played nor played against. Uh, they're one of the easiest armies to paint, from what I understand. Um, I can't say much about them. They were one of the better armies, I think, in the game. 
but I just never really ran across people that played them, and I never played them myself. And then Demons of Chaos, which is basically all the different demon units all put together. So Nurgle, Slanesh, Corn, Zinch, all together. I had a Zinch army to some extent, but not very much. Um, Empire, there was a guy by the name of Kevin who played Empire. Uh, we've played a few games, but he was mostly a 40k player, so we didn't play as many. And then uh, Tomb Kings, one of the uh, people who basically had the store, had that army. I never played against him, but he loved the Tomb Kings. So, that's basically what I feel about, like, the thing about uh, 8th edition, for me, personally, was it, it created a, a lot of memories that I still think about today. You know, and I, whenever I see these guys on occasion, uh, or I see them more often, I'll talk, we'll talk, we'll somehow, we'll come to the conversation of talking about that battle, and we both remember it, and we both had such a great time playing it, that we laugh about it, you know, we laugh about what occurred in it, you know. Um, especially, like I said, the two-on-two -two games, which I actually love, between Dark Elves and Wood Elves, they were, they were uh, an absolute blast. Um... But these are my memories, so pe other people's experiences may have been not very good with 8th edition. But again, the reason that they moved on to, ninth, or to Age of Sigmar was to keep up with the computer age, to make the game shorter, faster, and easier, and I don't blame them for it. And they, I do like some things about it, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Now let's talk about how 8th edition ended. It ended essentially with these books back here, and I'll pull one of them out and show them to you. I don't know if any, you know, if the viewers have seen this, but we'll bring out the Nagash book. So this is Nagash. It's actually a couple books, and basically there was always this discussion of the end of times in uh, eighth edition, seventh, so on and so forth. Like the time is going to eventually end. And so, <clears throat> Games Workshop got to a point where they said, you know, let's just end the old world and let's start uh, Age of Sigmar. So that's what we're going to do. So they wrote this, these, this is basically a book, a, a story of end, of end times. And it talks about all about the really important people within, um, you know, whether they be dwarves, whether they be, you know, dark elves, whether they're chaos, and then they had, along with it, they had some, some, uh, I think, gaming uh, aids that you could play. Like they gave you stat lines for all these different things, and you could actually play the end times uh, as they were putting these books out. And I, if I remember right, they had somewhere in here they had a lot of pictures of models, Games Workshop models, which they did a really good job with. But I can't, like I can't remember if it's just one section or just throughout. It looks like it's just throughout the book. Yeah, anyway. So, there was, uh, there was number one, which was Nagash. Then they went to, uh, one of my favorite characters in uh, the lore is uh, Glotkin. Absolutely love Glotkin. Glotkin. One of the reasons I got into Nurgle was because of that character right there that they put on the front cover. The characters. It's basically three brothers, and I'm not going to tell the story, but if you're interested in a really interesting, cool story, look up the story of Glotkin uh, from Games Workshop. It's a great story. And then there's the book Cain, Tranquil, which is the uh, lizard, lizard men, I guess. And then... Um, I didn't even open those two. I, I like I read up to the what one, two, three, and then I did not read the last two. I'm hoping there's not a sixth one because then I'm missing one. But anyway, that's what I'll uh, just end right there. Uh, this is my rant on Eighth Edition, and I'm going to move in and talk about Age of Sigmar, and then my thoughts on that, which you can already tell they're not really horribly negative, but they're not positive. And then um, we'll talk about uh, 40K a little bit. And then 
I'm going to talk about the new game that I've already mentioned that I'm going to try out that's going to kind of fill this uh, gap that I kind of have of 8th edition fantasy, which was one of my favorites uh, to play. So we'll be right back and we'll talk about Age of Sigmar. Old Man Sarge back. We've got, uh, I've got out my Age of Sigmar uh, stuff that I've accumulated, which isn't much. <clears throat> and I also have some 40k out, which I'll talk about it at the same time. So, Age of Sigmar, I have the Maggots of Nurgle, Maggot Kin of Nurgle, sorry, the Gloom Spite Gits, Night Haunt, uh, Hennets of Slanesh, Daughters of Cain, City of Sigmar, and Slaves of Darkness. I do not have a very large collection because I really lost interest in the game really fast. And of course, we have the, uh, the other problem, which is the, uh, the COVID thing going on right now. <clears throat> There's the rule book. The rule book uh, isn't much. Like, there isn't a whole lot of rules associated with it. That's by design to try to keep the game simple, fast, uh, and again, it's really not what I enjoy. But, and the other thing, here, here's the other thing, is lore. I hate the lore. I passionately hate the lore. So, the end of times basically destroyed the old world, so it's gone. So then Age of Sigmar says, oh, all these gods are, you know, they've ascended into godhood, like Sigmar and um, Malkith, I think, and <clears throat> there's a few others, and they're all, like, all the worlds of reality are these bubbles, and you go through these gates to get to these bubbles to fight. It's extremely high fantasy, and really not interesting to me at all. It's like, I don't know. I, I don't like it at all. But, they have come out with the coolest character um, of any of them. Like, this character is so, in my opinion, it's so cool. Um, it is cooler than anything in the old world, and that is Marathi. Marathi, which she's from the Daughters of Cain, uh, she's in that army, and here's the book on Marathi itself. I had to get that because I absolutely love Marathi in this game. I don't care for her in the old world, but I absolutely love her in uh, Age of Sigmar. Uh, by far the best developed character I've seen in this particular game. In fact, my one of my friends, who, by the way, is an expert painter, um, and I'm trying to get him to paint one last model for me. He says he's done painting for other people, but I'm trying to get him to paint Marathi for me because I absolutely love Marathi's lore. She basically, Slanesh ate all the, in the old world, ate all of the, um, the Dark Elves and the High Elves, I guess, and then Marathi got eaten as well, and so Marathi is inside of him, and she does some you know, horrible things to get out of him. I'm, I, I'm just paraphrasing the story as I've been told. I read a little bit of it, but one of my friends told me, and it just sounds so cool. Um, so she gets out, but when she, when she, she has some sort of slanesh uh, taint, and so for her, it turns her into this, like, she's actually not beautiful anymore, and she's so conceited that she wants to be beautiful, and so she has two models. One of them is <coughs> how she looks, how she makes other people view her, and then how she looks. So, let me see if I can find a picture of her model in here. And all, she then, sh she makes a deal, I guess. Let's see. There she is, right there. So here's Marathi in reality. And here is how she wants the world to view her. And she is one of the most flawed characters um, in, that Games Workshop, in my opinion, has come out with. And what I mean by flawed, I mean beautifully flawed. Like, she is awesome. And um, so everybody, you know, no, nobody really knows what she really looks like, except for a few gods, I think, like Nagash and maybe, uh, I don't remember, the Chaos. Maybe some of the Chaos people know. 
But so this is how she thinks she wants everybody to think about her, you know, as this beautiful woman. She's very conceited, but it's actually what she looks like and makes her angry to turn into this form, I guess. But she's also got all of these elves, dark elves, um, who were the daughters of Cain, who were in the old world, like the witch elves, essentially. But a lot of them, when they came back, they didn't come back as witch elves. She brought them back as half snake people. Great lore! I mean, this is, that's, that's awesome. And when they're talking about um, redoing their uh, old world, I know that it doesn't make any sense to do it because of the way that time flows and everything, but oh, if they could make Marathi in the old world, uh, it would be awesome. Um, but I don't really like the game that much. I mean, as I've joked with some of my friends, hey, let's just put the models right next to each other and roll dice. Because there's that maneuver that I enjoyed in 8th edition is, is basically gone. People will say, well, there's still a maneuver because you can move your units up and stuff. There's really not that much maneuver in the game. It's designed that way. It's designed to be fast, quick, and easy for the younger generation to get into the game and want to play it on the tabletop. And us grognars, <clears throat> we're kind of going out. So it's, you know, to me, it's not that interesting of a game to play. But I will play it on occasion with some of my friends because they like it and I like to, you know, play a game. So I've got these armies essentially. This one of course I have only because I've had all my older models. I'm not really happy with Night Haunt. <coughs> it's not really my kind of army. I don't know why I built it. Um, I do like Slanesh. They're fun to play. Uh, as fun as I can have. I don't really enjoy them as much. The uh, Maggotkin, they're okay. Uh, Daughters of Cain, I absolutely adore. Like, if somebody says, I want to play Age of Sigmar, I want to bring my Daughters of Cain army out. And, but the problem for a lot of people is this is an extremely expensive army to build. Uh, you know, like, one, one unit of ten witch elves is like $60, U.S. dollars. Um, I got this because I was trying to build up some uh, dark elves uh, to play separately. But I think some of these books may not actually be... Um, like, they're so out of whack now. That's the other complaint I have, is that they, they keep coming out with these generals' compendiums and stuff like that, and it really ages my books fast. So, like, I don't even know if these books, like, I don't even know if, if these books are useful anymore. There may be new codexes coming out. I don't think this is an actual codex. I think this is just a, a lore book with some stuff at the back. Anyway, I'm going to turn off my alarm as it's going off, and then we'll talk about um, 40K. All right, Old Man Sarge back, talking about 40K, um, a game that I only really got into because my friends liked it, and I wanted to play games with my friends, so I played 40K. 40K um, hasn't changed a whole lot as far as my main concerns and problems with it. It is not a game of maneuver at all. It is a game of target allocation. That's really all the game is. So you sit back, you, you, once you get your units placed on the board, then you target allocate. You, you shoot at whatever the most dangerous targets are on the other side of the board. I don't know why people like it so much. It's a very popular game. And people enjoy the, the universe the fluff behind it. And I've tried to get into it, but I just don't like it. It's just, you know, I, the movement of a tank is six inches. Six inches. There might be more now. I mean, you might be able to go 12. I don't know. But there was a time at which the game was, you know, like, you hardly ever moved across the board. I mean, you can deep strike in and get some units in faster in other places or whatever, but, oh, my word... Um, yeah, it should be a game of maneuver. You have futuristic stuff, but the problem is, is that you'd probably have to pay on it, play on an 8x12 table to really uh, get maneuver out of the game because things should be able to shoot much further because you're in the future. Um, the fluff behind the game. Uh, I like the fluff a lot. Um, the 40K has got 
some of the best fluff out there. It's kind of like a future that is almost fascistic. A fascistic future that humanity is living in. And there's all these problems that they're having to fight with. And I know maybe that problem, the, the term fascistic is, it upsets people, but the, the empire is not, a, is not a free society. Like, there's no free societies that, <laughs> that I can even imagine in the game. Um, you know, the Tao are socialists, you know, basically commies, communists, uh, and then, then all the other people, the humanity is are basically uh, imperialistic. I mean, I don't know what how else to describe it. It's a very kind of depressing future, but it's not unenjoyable. I enjoy the, um, the things about the lore, but I've read a few books, and I don't like them. I've read... Um, I don't even have them, because I didn't like them. I got rid of them. One of them I read was a... Uh, there are two of them were f f like space marines. And here's one of the biggest complaints about sci-fi, okay? One of the primary goals of writing a story is to have people identify with the th things that people are going through. And they can kind of visualize and feel like, oh, I could be that person. I could, you know, like little kids. Like take Star Wars, for example, Luke Skywalker. You know, he starts out, and he's just a kid, just a teenage guy or kid, uh, trying to get by in the desert, working for his uncle or whatever. <coughs> you know, and then throughout the story, he finds out that he, you know, has, he has this attribute with the Force or whatever, and he gets more and more powerful. And you're just, you're develop as they're watching the movies or reading the books, you're developing with the character, and you're just enjoying the fact that this guy came from nothing, and he got to something, and that's like that. Like almost everybody enjoys that kind of a story. What people don't really enjoy, some people, my kind of people, what my kind of people don't really enjoy is the Mary Sues. You or and I, I don't know what the name for guys is, but when you have a a character, whether it's male or female or whatever, where they they're already there, they're already at the top. They, like, oh, I'm just discovering I have all this power. I don't have to work at getting doing anything. And that the example of the Mary Sue is Ray and the Star Wars that, oh my gosh, Kathleen Kennedy absolutely destroyed, you know, that whole franchise. Whatever was left of it, by the way. Because, in my opinion, and this is a side, side note, Star Wars was good for two and a half movies. That's, that's my opinion. Two and a half movies. I remember as a young person going to watch <coughs> the first Star Wars, which is episode four, right, with Luke Skywalker. Fantastic! At the time in the 70s, it was absolutely fantastic in the late 70s. And then you went to Empire Strikes Back, and the Empire's got the upper hand. And you're just, oh my, what a great movie. Absolutely the pinnacle of that, of those, that franchise was Empire Strikes Back. And then they come out with Return of the Jedi. Again, my opinion, first half of the movie, absolutely crazy good. You know, all the things that they were doing uh, with Luke Skywalker, showing how he, you know, how he has gotten more powerful through, you know, training with Yoda and all that sort of stuff, and honing his skills, absolutely fantastic. And then they introduced the Ewoks. And as a young person, when I saw the Ewoks, and I wasn't the only one, there was a few other people, and they were just like, what did they just do? This has got to be the dumbest thing. They're trying to, like, what, get little kids to like the movie? Like, five-year-olds are going to want to buy little Ewok toys or something? Absolutely, ridiculously dumb. It's like, at that point, the movie went downhill. And I'm not saying there weren't good parts in there after that. But if you took all that Ewok stuff out, would be a fantastic movie. It'd even be shorter, and you'd still be fantastic. But you got these little Ewoks with their little stone spears and their little nets, and they're taking out stormtroopers with blasters and their mechanical machines or whatever. Their walkers, dumb, absolutely atrociously stupid. The next three movies, they tried the same thing. Hey, let's bring in this Jar Jar Binks. You know, everybody will like him. 
horrible, horrible movies. I, like, I don't know what happened, and then he sold it to some feminist, or sold it to Disney. They put some feminist in charge of it, and she decided to destroy the whole universe with her, you know, what is it, uh, the forces female thing. I mean, why would you do that? Why would you upset your entire base, or a large part of your base, to try to push your, your agenda? And if you're going to make Ray a cool character, because at the very first of episode seven, she was fairly cool, like she was doing her scrapping. You know, she was running or going into these ships to pull out scraps to sell them because she's poor. Like, that was cool. Like, now you, you're starting over with the loop type thing. But everything just was like, oh, you got a droid. Well, what other movie had droids? Oh, you know, they're on a desert planet. What other movie had a desert planet? Oh, they want to destroy the, you know, the, the Death Star. Oh, what other? Oh, this is not the regular Death Star. This is a super duper Death Star. They even made a point of it in the movie. I'm just like, oh. After that, I stopped watching those movies. They were so incredibly bad. But my point is, with all of that garbage you just heard come out of my mouth that you probably don't agree with, but the point of all that is, if you make a Mary Sue character, if you make a character that's so powerful, you're telling everybody how powerful the character is. Like, I don't really, I'm not really seeing, you know, like their trials and tributes. I mean, they're not me. I could never be them, right? Like, so Space Marines. The first two books I read in this universe were Space Marine books. And I was bored. First of all, they introduced these, one of the books I read was with the orcs and orcs are just dumb in this universe. What, they're organic, they're like little pods, and I know they've tried to like reset things a few, a couple times or think about it, but I, I think that was the very beginning, that these were nothing but like spores of fungi or something. And it's just dumb. The whole, that whole thing with the universe, orcs being the way they are, and space marines being so powerful, I'm like, I mean, I almost want to hear about what they did, but I don't want to read about, read about them. Because if that makes any sense, it's kind of like, they're kind of cool if all I have to worry about is, let's just think about uh, what they've accomplished, right? And, and, oh, the Space Marines showed up and they fought here and they did that or whatever. That's fine. That's cool. But reading a book about a character as a Space Marine is boring to me. There's, they're Mary Sue's. They're all Mary Sue's. And there's, there's really nothing, you know, they're so powerful or whatever, and they're not really human anymore, that I, I just find them boring. But, I did pick up this book that my friend let me borrow, because I complained about that book. And so my friend, who really loves 40K, and he argues with me all the time, he thinks I'm dumb, because I don't like it. He gave me this book on the Gene Stealer cult, and some, like, I don't at the beginning, I mean, you know it's the Gene Stealer cult when you see the book, but you didn't, I didn't really, I guess, I'm just not smart enough or not really into the lore as much, and so when I started reading it, I didn't realize that some of the characters were actually cultists, and the author did such a great job, and I can't remember the name of the book because I don't have it, of making you, like, feel like, oh, wow, these uh, religious people have landed on this planet, and we, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, it turns out they're actually gene stealer cults, you know. They don't know they are, and, <clears throat> and then they go and they talk about um, the characters. Some of the characters in the book were from Astro Militarum, which are like uh, just regular humans. So there weren't any space marines in this book. It was all humans or gene stealer cults. And then they fought each other in the end. It was a great book. Like, I enjoyed that book. I could identify with the characters. I really liked that book. Because they're just regular people who are doing extraordinary things or being put into an extraordinary situation. And the twist that they did with the Gene Stealer cult was really good. But I don't want to read any more books. And I'm not going to with any Space Marines. They're boring as heck to me. And I know people enjoy it. Whatever. You like your Space Marines. That's fine. They're boring to me. I don't really care uh, to indulge into that. I did read this book um, on the daughters of, uh, or pardon me, the 
Oh uh, gosh, what do they call them? I, I don't want to call them what people call them because that'll be Adeptus Sororitus. Now, <clears throat> this is one of the saving graces for me is the Adeptus Sororitus Gene Stealer Cult. Um, again, I'm a I'm a grognar, but I'm a lore player. I love when you give me good lore. Like I'll play I'll play the game even though I may not enjoy the mechanics of the game. So I picked up the armies that I actually like the lore of. I enjoy the lore. So notice no Space Marines because I don't care for them. Maybe I'll play them, but I got I had Astro Militarum for a while. I got rid of that army. Um, mainly because the mechanics just bogged the game so down so much. There were so many units and so much stuff going on that a game could take, you know, six hours. It was just horrendous. <clears throat> but I, I liked, I liked uh, uh, Austro Militarum for their lore. I liked Gene Stealer Cult for their lore. I love the daughters, or the Adeptus Sororitas. These are basically ladies, and I'm not going to go through the lore too much and talk about because most people know about it, but these uh, are, they're fanatics. Again, you give me a flawed, like, uh, a character that's, got, that's flawed, or if you give me a, um, um, a un or an organization like the Adeptus Sororitis, which are kind of like, they're just so openly flawed. They're fanatics, and they worship the emperor, and <clears throat> they do horrible things to people if they don't believe in, in, their, in their faith. Um, and then they fight all these bad guys. I, I truly like uh, the Adeptus Sororitis, uh, the lore behind them. Um, I don't know if I'm really into like the specific characters, <clears throat> but I like the organization a lot. Just like Gene Stealer Cult, there isn't necessarily a character, <clears throat> but it's who they who they are and what they do that uh, really uh, intrigues me about that. And I'm glad they brought that into 40k. Uh, Tyranids, I just needed a bad guy army. I like the Tyranids because they just don't care about humanity or anything. They don't seem to have any goals except for just devouring everything. Um, I'm not sure I like the fact that they completely leave a world barren and move on to the next, but that's, that's the idea behind them. I like Death Guard, even though they're a Space Marine army, I like the fact that they're just like decayed and... You know, so I enjoy I enjoy the lore, uh, overall lore about things in 40k. I just don't like the game that much. It's just a sit back and shoot at your opponent game, and now they're making it smaller or potentially with this new edition. And the other thing I don't like about Age of Sigmar or 40k, and maybe even when I used to play um, Fantasy, is I don't like how quickly they go through books. Like, I can't keep up. I, I'm sure, like, I have two codexes of Gene Stealer Cult. And I think this one is out of date. This one right here, like, I don't think you can even use it. This one is probably maybe still usable, except that they come out with these appendix, appendons all the time. And, like, like here, here's one that's, that's uh, for some of the armies. And then they've got, here's the 2019 approved and updates and then then they came out with a new book with the new rules um, and I I've read through the rules and the way and I'm just like that's just too much to try to like I, I get what how many three different sub objectives and I've got yeah you know, I was just like you know what I'm not really that keen on the game to start with I'll play it if I get involved with my friends maybe but I'm kind of done with the 40k, and I'm kind of done with Age of Sigmar. They're kind of doing the same thing here. I don't think these books are still usable <coughs> in the game, but I do love Daughters of Cain. I do love Marathi. So there's like there's bits and pieces of these games that I really enjoy, and the lores and some things. But sorry, that got cut off. But um, I I just don't like the mechanics. These are not games designed for me. Um, these games are designed for other people, younger generations potentially. But a grognar like me, with my particular tastes, 
they're not designed and tailored for me. And that's fine because I'm probably a minority out there. They're looking for um, obtaining the largest audience possible. Now, their models are absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. The other thing I don't like is I don't like to paint. <clears throat> so if I was to do battle reports of the things I like to do um, on this channel for miniature gaming, I don't think I have the time to paint up all these armies. There's no way. I don't, I don't like to paint. I'm not good at it. I have to spend a bunch of money to have somebody else paint. Um, so I'm just kind of like, eh. I'll play them on occasion. Somebody asks me to play, maybe I'll play. Um, I'll probably lose because I don't, I'm not into the, the thing, the game a lot. That's the other thing is that these games you have to be dedicated to be playing often to be good. I mean, if you don't play that often, then you're going to have to spend a couple of days studying, and even then, your opponent's probably going to bring out stuff. And then the other problem, again, is they change the books so fast. The editions get changed so fast, the codexes get changed so fast, that unless you're in the game all the time, you're behind. And that's where I've basically been for quite a while, is behind uh, in, this game, in these two games. So, Age of Sigmar... 40k, I'm going to say I don't think you'll see much of those on this channel, but an 8th edition is one of those dead editions, so you'll probably not see that on this channel, but I'm going to do uh, another little blurb on what I'm going to try, and it may not be something I like, but we're going to give it a try, and that's what I'll talk about next, which is <coughs> Kings of War. So we'll be right back. We're going to talk about Kings of War and some of the other games that um, Mantic Games or uh, Warlord Games puts out. And I'm also going to talk about the World War II game that I really enjoy. And I've been playing with my friend quite a bit. And I've been painting up stuff like piece by piece. But it, again, since I'm a horrible painter, it takes me a long time to paint anything. So we'll be right back and we'll discuss some of the games that I actually am playing currently. Okay, Old Man Sarge back. I've talked about um, 8th edition, which I adore, absolutely love. Um, and I forgot to mention, I may have forgotten to mention it, but I'll just talk about it one last time. My understanding is Games Workshop is planning on doing a, I know I mentioned it, but I'll say it again, a game that's going to be like 8th edition, old fantasy in the old world. How that looks, I don't know. <clears throat> um, like I said, one of my friends hopes it's 15 millimeter. That'd be cool, um, but I don't know how popular 15 millimeter would be. And the reason I don't think that's going to happen is because Games Workshop is phenomenal at making models, and the smaller scale you make, the less important the details and everything in are the models. So I don't really see Games Workshop doing that. I would say they're going to stick with their 28 millimeter, and maybe they'll come out with a side game. Of 15 millimeter or something but I think they've had a lot of success with their their model line at 28 millimeters so they're gonna stay at that point that's my belief anyway but we'll see what that looks like um, if it brings back maneuver if it brings back block army combat um, moving across the table then I would be interested to see what that game looks like but in the meantime I have pretty much put Age of Sigmar and 40k aside. I'm not going to burn my armies or anything. I'm not upset or angry with 40 or with Games Workshop. I understand why they're doing what they're doing. They're doing it because that's the market. So they want to appease the market as much as they can. But it's just for an old grognar as myself, it doesn't really. Um, it's not really my kind of game. So these are the games that I've kind of picked up recently to try to, um, I guess, get get the feel that I always enjoyed, which was the block army combat. And so I picked up Hail Caesar. These are made by different game companies, but I think they're owned by the same people, Kings of War, which is made by Mantic Games, and Hail Caesar. Um, I also have Bolt Action, but I haven't played it in forever. You can see some of my old videos on there. I like the first edition. I started to 
not be as interested as they uh, went to the second edition. And the big reason was that one of the big mechanics I really adored was the pinning. And a lot of people complained that, oh, my army can't, or my unit can't do anything because it's just pinned down and they're not go doing anything. It's, it's a waste of time. And they didn't enjoy that game. I liked that version of the game. Um, I liked the strategy of not necessarily trying to kill somebody, uh, their units, but also pinning them down, basically making sure they can't move so you can get the objectives and they can't. I like that, to disordering, disrupting, or whatever. I like that mechanic in the game. They've made it easier to get rid of by um, using your rally order, which just enables you to just rally some huge amounts. So your units are pinned for... The pinning mechanic is less impactful, I guess, is what I'll say in the game. Which some people like, I didn't, I didn't like. So I kind of backed away from that quite a while ago because of that. Um, and that's the thing, is you change rules, you're going to gain some people, you're going to lose some people. That's just kind of how it works. You're hoping that some of the people that you um, that may not care for your changes like the game enough where they're not going to just ditch it and leave. But I was one of those people for, for uh, bolt action. I did not like the fact that they, got, they, made, they diminished the power of pinning and I just soon not play the game that much anymore so I've kind of backed away from it. I've never played Hail Caesar. Um, Hail Caesar is uh, this is kind of what fantasy 8th edition to some degree was like but it's historical so you've got all the people that um, fought in the in the classical age of humanity from the Bronze Age on up to even the Iron Age so it covers even combats with, um, like the Vikings, which happened around, you know, 800, 900 A.D., and so that covers quite a quite a range of time frames. But then humanity didn't really have an enormous change in uh, <clears throat> weaponry at the time either. We were kind of slow in our development of of getting better weapons, and so that it's good game I think to cover all that. I haven't tried it yet. I got some models, but instead of getting uh, Warlord Games models, again, the problem that I have with Warlord Games, Mantic Games, um, and it's not their fault, it, it's their models aren't the best. They're like, they got maybe a good gaming system, we'll see, but their models are not the top notch. So, like, Games Workshop puts out the best fantasy models, Kings of War uh, puts out their own line of fantasy models. But they don't, they don't look as good, to me at least. Um, Hail Caesar, uh, Warlord Games puts out quite a bit of uh, those models. But from what I've reviewed, Fitrix Games puts out some incredible um, models for uh, the classical period. I mean, very like they're right next to Games Workshop as far as the quality, in my opinion. But they do historical stuff for the most part now. So I haven't tried Hail Caesar yet. I kind of, um, I got some stuff. I started to put stuff together, but I really, I just haven't got into the game as of yet. Um, another game I absolutely love is Flames of War. Um, again, I'm a Grognar. I love Maneuver. So this is, as far as World War II goes, the top notch of games out there. And the reason is, is that it, it encompasses um, company-sized combats because you'll have um, you'll have platoons that are there's 15 millimeter, and what that enables you to is to take a table that's a, a six by four, and you can put a large army on that table. You can play a large game if you want, and if you put two tables together, you could play a huge army or a game, or you can even do a smaller game, but you've got so much room in the game um, <clears throat> with a eight, 4 by 8 table, or pardon me, 12 by 8 table, that you can, like, you can just imagine how much terrain you can put out and how much um, of gameplay you can have. I haven't actually recorded any games because I don't have painted up mar armies yet. But as I've been playing with one of my opponents, one of my friends, his name is Nathan, um, 
well, as I've been playing with him, he's we I've been painting up the units that are like the MVPs. And so I've got some Russian units painted up and I've got some German units painted up. But I'm such a horrible slow painter that I just don't have enough yet. So Flames of War, um, for a person like myself with my kind of desires, the mechanics of the game is phenomenal, really well designed, and the um, the game, the models themselves are good. So I mean, I maybe there's cheaper, better models somewhere else, but I I buy um, the Battlefront models uh, because they're I feel that they're good enough. And Hail Caesar, I think you can buy the Warlord models and just be just as happy. You don't have to go and buy the Vitrix. You can buy uh, Warlord Games models and they're just as good too. Bolt Action for their skirmish game, their models are good as well. Kings of War, however, I'm sad to say that <clears throat> I'm not really impressed with the model line, but maybe they'll make some improvements. Maybe they'll take some investment dollars and put it into whoever those guys are behind the scenes at Games Workshop that design their fantastic models. There's no reason why Kings of War can't have the same thing. So, Kings of War is basically a simplified, it seems to be a simplified version of 8th edition. Um, we're going to give it a try next Saturday. You're going to see some unpainted models on the table. We're, I'm going to have a game with one of my friends. We're going to try it out. Uh, it might be a little slow. I'll just tell you what happened, who's flanking who, or doing whatever. One of the concerns I had with the game, because I couldn't see it initially when I went through, is how does what, what benefit is flanking? Because in, in old classical battles, when you, uh, when you approached each other or whatever, you, if you could roll up the flanks, that's where most of the time the, um, the, con the, the battles would be won by one side or another, even if they were outnumbered. So like Julius Caesar would do that, Alexander the Great was famous for it. Um, like every battle out there, the battle, the leaders, the generals, they knew that they had to keep their flanks covered and protected because if they didn't, they were going to, you know, they were, could get easily destroyed. Um, and so I was worried about that because everything else from here looks like straightforward. You know, you move your units, you can charge into combat, you do your melee attacks, you know, you, uh, uh, you can do multiple attacks against the same units. Uh, you have your range, so you shoot, you know, and then you got your melee where you fight. And I'm like, okay, and then you got your nerve or your ch test route. But I was thinking, like, what benefit does it have to be in flanking and I found it in here somewhere let me see if I can locate it and then I'll s okay right here so we're gonna go right here and I'm gonna show you how this makes a difference in the game and I think that it'll be it just fine and it'll work out to my expectations it says to attack the unit you charge roll a number of dice equal to the charging units attack stat okay fine fine good the next part says, if your unit is attacking an enemy in, in its, to its flank, it doubles its attacks. If your unit is attacking the enemy rear, it triples its attacks. So, um, in the past, in 8th edition, uh, Fantasy, which is a long time ago, I know I'm bringing it up again, but if you could hit somebody in the flank or the rear, you took away their rank bonuses, and that was for testing like their nerve, okay? That was, that was essentially their nerve or their way that they were testing to see if the unit routed or flee combat or whatever the case may be. But this game handles it differently. Instead of impacting the nerve, you get more attacks. And so if you had 10 attacks, now all of a sudden you have 20. So you're going to double the number of hits that you have on somebody if you hit them in the flank, possibly triple the number of hits on somebody if you hit them in the rear on average. Okay, so it should have an, a, a big impact on the game, um, and that's kind of what your goal should be, I would think. It's not only design a good army, not only put it on the table, but maneuver it in such a way that <clears throat> that you can start flanking or you know hitting your opponent in the rear if that ever could happen. But we'll see how that all plays out. So, and then there's two ways, two things that happened uh, when you test for nerve. One of them is to see if your unit is wavering, which has some impacts 
short-term impacts on that army, and then the route basically removes the unit from the game. It looks like it's a pretty straightforward game. Um, I think it's simpler than 8th edition, and I think that uh, we'll see how it works actually on the field. Um, what I'm going to go through next for uh, my own and your viewing pleasure, I guess, is the building of an army because there's a specific way that you build your forces. So it depends on how big of a unit you pick that determines how many other smaller units that you can have with that force. So I'm going to build a 2,000 point army next. <clears throat> I'll be back and we'll talk about um, how I built it, how I, why I decided to build it. I'm going to use the goblins. So I'm going to use the goblins in here. I'm going to use uh, unpainted models, so don't get too upset. Especially when you see our game, it's going to be unpainted models. But we're going to play, I'm going to, I'm going to form this army just to see uh, what, what I can build out of it. So we'll be back uh, after I get the units on the table to build. But I highly recommend Flames of War. Highly recommend Flames of War. Don't know about Hail Caesar yet. 8th um, edition. I'm hoping Games Workshop comes out with a really good, good game that'll be something that I enjoy, but completely understand why they went the route they went. But for now, we're going to play Kings of War, and we're going to see how much we enjoy the game. And if we enjoy it, maybe we'll, uh, we'll paint up some more models to put on the table. Maybe we can actually have a painted army uh, battle report with it. There may not be as popular as some of the 40k battle reports and stuff, but as you can tell on my channel, I've got a lot of things on there that I don't really care how popular that they are. I just want to record for my own benefit and for other people who might feel the same way I do, and they want to give this game a try. Again, you've got Games Workshop uh, old 8th edition models, uh, or you want to pick up the Mantic game models. They're, they're inexpensive. They're a lot less expensive. Um, this book, and there's a couple other things that I'm getting for our game. Not much you really need. Um, and you can play with older models, you can buy some on eBay or whatever else you want, and you can probably throw down a pretty interesting game with some friends. And I think this is a pretty easy uh, system, but we'll see. So I'll be back after we uh, start designing this force, and we'll let you know how it looks. Old Van Sarge back again. We're going to have the Battle of the Greys, open field, no terrain, just blocks of infantry and cavalry fighting each other in Kings of War. So we are going to be doing a Battle of Kings of War just to see how it flows. But <clears throat> and I'm sorry, you can't really see. It's hard to tell what all this stuff is because it's not painted. But those are Goblin Spearmen. Um, in the book, they call them sharp sticks. So if I can get this away from the glare, they are a horde because I have actually 48 models, not 40, which I'll explain in just a moment. So, but they're inexpensive for that many. It's 155 points. Um, the cavalry are represented by spider riders, and there's two different kinds of cavalry. We've got these. Uh, flea bag rider sniffs, they're the ones that have the bows on their back. So if we look here, you can see that they there's a bow, you know, he, I mean, pardon me, quivers on their backs. So the, any ones that has quivers in their backs are these flea bag, and they all, they all can shoot. Like this is an entire uh, regiment of them. Actually, this is separate. So this is this is a regiment of those. And then this is just a um, regular troop unit. They limit the number of troops that you can have in the book. But what I'm going to do is I don't I want to spend too much time on on <clears throat> on this with this particular video. I'm actually going to do a separate video for the battle report itself. But I'm going to call this the Battle of Gray Fields because I'm playing with, of course, nothing but gray models, unpainted forces in this particular game. On the other side of the field, we're going to have High Elves, which are Elves in this game, and Dwarves, Dwarf Allies. 
So there's a whole block of Dwarf Allies. There's no artillery. All we have is um, just regular troops. So I don't really know how, uh, what my impressions of Kings of War will be. So far from reading the rules, looking at everything, it looks like a pretty quick, fast game. Um, I'm going to see if this kind of fulfills the my desire to have a block infantry games. This is an 8x12 table. Um, again, Age of Sigmar doesn't really give me what I like. <clears throat> and I know why they put it out, but we're going to give this a shot. I'm hoping that this will fulfill my desire to have ancients fighting on an open battlefield. And then eventually I'll be trying uh, Hail Caesar out, maybe some of their game systems if there's more out there, but this is for these particular fantasy battles. So we'll be back, uh, well we won't be back, we're, we're done with this particular rant. We're going to be moving on to uh, the battle itself, and it, you'll be able to upload the battle report shortly after this one, I'm hoping, just to kind of see how things flowed, and I'll tell you every turn what happened.